The history of Budapest dates back to ancient times, with evidence of human habitation dating as far back as the Stone Age. However, it was during the Roman era that the area began to flourish. Then known as Aquincum, it was a vital outpost of the Roman Empire. Following the fall of the Roman Empire, Budapest witnessed successive waves of conquest and settlement by various peoples including the Magyars, Huns, and Mongols. In the late 9th century, the Magyars established the Kingdom of Hungary, laying the foundation for Budapest's emergence as a prominent European capital. The name Budapest itself is a component of two ancient cities, Buda and Pest. Buda, situated on the western bank of the Danube, was known for its royal palaces and its strategic fortifications, while Pest, located on the opposite bank, thrived as a bustling commercial center. Throughout the centuries, Budapest endured periods of prosperity and turmoil from the splendor of the Renaissance to the devastation of wars and invasions. The city reached new heights during the Austro-Hungarian Empire, experiencing rapid urbanization and cultural flourishing marked by grand architectural projects and intellectual achievements. In the 20th century, Budapest faced significant challenges, including two world wars and decades of communist rule under Soviet influence. Despite these trials, the city persevered, emerging as a symbol of resilience and renewal following the fall of communism in 1989. Since then, Budapest has undergone a remarkable transformation, embracing democracy and free market principles while preserving its rich heritage and distinct identity. Today, Budapest stands as a vibrant cosmopolitan hub where historic landmarks blend seamlessly with modern amenities. Visitors are captivated by the city's stunning architectural marvels, including the iconic Parliament Building, Buda Castle, and Matthias Church, which reflect a blend of Gothic, Renaissance, and Baroque styles. Beyond its architectural splendors, Budapest boasts a dynamic cultural scene with world-class museums, theaters, and galleries showcasing Hungary's artistic legacy. The city's thermal baths, a tradition dating back to Roman times, offers relaxation and rejuvenation amidst opulent surroundings. Moreover, Budapest's culinary landscape is a testament to its diverse influences, featuring a fusion of traditional Hungarian dishes with international flavors. From hearty goulash to delicate pastries, the city tantalizes the taste buds of visitors from around the globe. The journey of Budapest from ancient settlement to modern metropolis is a testament to the resilience of its people and the enduring allure of its cultural heritage. As a crossroads of history and innovation, Budapest continues to captivate and inspire, inviting visitors to explore its rich tapestry of traditions, architecture, and experiences. Hello, and welcome to episode 10 of the Travel Like Locals podcast. I am your host, Alex Tabry. In the summer of 2022, following a work trip that brought me to my company's London and Paris offices, I decided to take a week off and travel around the area. One of these stops brought me to the amazing city of Budapest, Hungary. I arrived late one night, headed to my Airbnb, then woke up the next morning and walked 10 miles around the city, taking in the beauty of the Danube and the three different regions of the city. Buddha, Pest, and Old Buddha, before heading back to the airport for my next stop. Though I only got a small taste of what the city had to offer, seeing the grand architecture that varied from medieval style to renaissance style was really cool to be able to take in and definitely left me wanting to return in the future to explore more. I was so exhausted my first night and then so busy the next day trying to see as much as possible that I never got the chance to try the local cuisine. There is probably no dish that is more synonymous with Budapest than goulash. So if you would like to watch me make this, you can find my recipe video on TikTok and Instagram at TLL underscore pod. For this episode, I have interviewed Kata, a local tour guide. We talked about the amazing food, thermal baths, and got some local tips on the huge Christmas markets. For all of Kata's recommendations and more, be sure to check out my website, www.tllpod.com. But for now, on to the interview. To welcome our next guest on the podcast, a tour guide from Budapest. Kata, thank you for uh, being with us today. Hi, how are you today? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? I'm grand. Thank you so much. Thanks for the call. <laughs> of course. So could you uh, tell us a bit how you got into being a tour guide? 
I actually been like an employee for many years and I actually got super bored with the computer job and being an assistant, it's not so much fun. So mm -hmm. basically I studied tourism like 20 years ago and I got my tour guide license back then because officially you need a license to do it, right? So I just didn't use it. But six, seven years ago, I was like, okay, I just want to do something different because uh, I'm too young to to be an assistant for the for the rest of my life. So I almost escaped to Bali to you know to to find new ways what to do with my life. But then um, back then already like eight years ago, I was doing some tours in my free time, like three times per month only. But those people who I met with they were like super inspirational and they told me that kata it's it seems that it is your past you should focus on this so that's how it it started actually i had my degree i got the freelancer status so that is my shorter story <laughs> of how it happened how it started awesome and do you specialize in any specific area of tourism Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I work as a tour, a tour guide. I work on my own and I do any, uh, special tours like food tours, sightseeing tours, nightlife tours, countryside trips. And yeah, I'm happy to organize tours based on special uh, ideas or preferences, of course. <laughs> But yeah, it's most of the time Budapest, but more and more people want to explore the countryside as well. Mm -hmm. So it's super interesting when people come and stay for more than two days. So then we can plan more things and can show the more real face of the city and the country. Awesome. So before I ask you anything else, can we go over the pronunciation? Because I know most people here would probably say, myself included, would say Budapest. But uh, I've heard a lot of more local people would say something similar to Budapest. Not st, but Budapest. Okay. <laughs> Budapest, which is sh and that's actually. <laughs> okay, that's very difficult for me to. <laughs> but usually, uh, I'm not even saying in Hungarian anymore, but in mm -hmm. English only, right? Because of my visitors, so I'm I'm a bit confused now how to say it properly in a like, Hungarian <laughs> way. But yeah, when I say it to American people, it's like Budapest, but at home it's. Budapest, but when you are in Budapest, you just say, I'm in Buda, I'm in past, because it okay. is two sides, officially three. So you never really say Budapest when you are there. Mm -hmm. You say Buda, the hilly part, you say Pest, the flat and more uh, vibrant part, or mm -hmm. Old Buda, which is again in the, in the area. Okay. And but Pest. Could... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and could you talk uh, more about those different areas of uh, the city? Because I know that the Danube basically crosses or cuts in between the different sections and just how those are laid out. Uh huh. So we are talking now about three parts. The oldest mm -hmm. part is called Old Buddha. The former uh, Roman, Romanian people, the Romans, sorry, not Romanians, but the Romans, the mm -hmm. ancestors of the Italian people were in that area back in the second and third centuries. So if you visit that area, it's still part of Budapest, but it's full of ancient Roman ruins, big rocks and the uh, ruins of churches and um, even a huge place called Aquincum can be found there. It's like, can be called as the second Pompeii in a way because of the ruins, mm. it's, it's a large territory. Uh, then uh, we can talk about Buddha, where you see an old castle, uh, the fisherman bastion, also it's located, it's all located um, on a hill. So it's very picturesque. So that castle was built, they started to build it back in the sec, uh, 20, uh, 12 centuries. Mm. Um, but later on, like in the 19th centuries, it got more parts because of the Habsburg dynasty, because of the Habsburg family from Austria. Mm -hmm. And then past is the, much, uh, the more youngest part out of the three. It is very vibrant. It started to be super lively at the end, from the end of the 19th centuries when the Habsburg uh, family started to invest more and more money in the city. Mm -hmm. So it is three parts and they were individual 
like cities until 1873 when these three places reunited. So since then, we just call it as Budapest. It is not just Buddha and past, but now you mm-hmm. know that is all Buddha is also part of the <sighs> part of the city. <laughs> okay, very cool. So just want to start off by asking you some maybe common myths about uh, Budapest and Hungary in general, uh, and for you to basically tell us if they're true or false. So the first one is that it is a common nickname is the Paris of the East. Yeah, that's what I hear from visitors. <laughs> yeah. So because of the river, they have the Sinai in Paris. We have the Danube, the second longest river in Europe. Yeah, it is one reason, actually. You can easily walk around. It can be uh, the second reason. Uh, third reason, when you walk around and it is terror season, I mean summer and spring and early autumn, you see lots of restaurants with the terraces, lots of round-shaped tables also need little chairs like in uh, in paris mm-hmm. lots of uh, different restaurants very very vibrant very colorful actually <laughs> okay um next one is hungary uses the euro no <laughs> no since 20 or 4 we are actually part of the european union but we never started to to use euro and it's not even in a discussion at the moment or it has never ever been really like in poland we joined at the same year in the same year but Mm -hmm. they still use their currency so we use hungarian forints but we just say forint Mm -hmm. and what's the exchange rate between the dollar and the forint i think one dollar is now equal to 364 Hungarian forints. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the next one is the Rubik's Cube was invented in Hungary. Yeah, invented by Mr. Erno Rubik, who used to work as a professor and he wanted to show his students uh, what they he wanted to teach his students uh, of of the dimensions, the three dimensions in this world. That's how it was born. Mm-hmm. And as I've heard, Anna Rubik is now in the United States somewhere, but oh. he has a fabulous home at home for sale. It's pretty expensive, <laughs> of course, because in a way, the Rubik cube, the shape of the cube, is <laughs> inserted to that place, to that house. Huh. Okay. And so did the Rubik's Cube craze, did that start in Hungary and expand outwards or? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Very cool. Yeah, so it's like a Hungary a very traditional Hungarian uh, gift idea. <laughs> and whenever <laughs> I see tourists from uh, this part of the world, from the United States, I always ask my people because even on the streets of Budapest, you can see the Rubik's Cube in a form of a street art. It can be a little mini statue or it's a, a, upon a, a wall, like on a firework as a, um, as a mural. Mm-hmm. So I always ask my uh, American visitors if they knew it, not they knew it, but if they had it at home. And most of the time, yes, you have it. <laughs> yes, I do as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Even the... in movies, you can see the Ruby Cube quite often. Really? After yeah. Yeah. It. Oh, yeah. All over. <laughs> That's cool. Um, the final myth is Hungary is inexpensive. Uh, in a way... You know what? Yeah, but salaries are lower, so it's hard to compare. No, I'm uh, at the moment uh, in Arizona. So when I do the shopping, it costs much more here, but I get salaries are higher as well. So, yeah, if you were coming from the United States to spend a couple of times in Hungary, it would be, yeah, less expensive for you. But for Hungarians, uh, it started to be super expensive and sometimes now it's as expensive or more expensive than Vienna. <laughs> wow. So, uh, yeah, it's confusing. Or the Christmas markets, if you check the prices, yeah, the prices were much lo- uh, higher than in Vienna in mm-hmm. the last two years. But, uh, yeah, you can still find super nice restaurants. If you are not looking for Michelin star restaurants or the super hip restaurants, you can find very good ones for a very affordable price, for sure. 
Okay. Yeah, I think I heard that that used to be more true than it is today. Like maybe 30 plus years ago, Hungary was considered a, a bit uh, less expensive, but it's basically uh, catching up. Yeah, actually, it was much cheaper. But after COVID, you know, people mm. just wanted to get more money because they couldn't earn in tourism. So probably mm -hmm. it is one of the big reasons, one of the lot of reasons why it got super expensive in restaurants or in hotels because they wanted to compensate the the last two years. Yeah. But yeah, I, I yeah, eating out or ordering food, it can be like food delivery. Yeah, now it's thirty percent more than it was before COVID. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um. Cool. So for anybody who wants to come and visit Budapest, when would you say is the best time of year? I would say April and May and then September and October and then in December around Christmas time to see the Christmas markets and see those little Christmas lights and all the nice buildings with the lights. Yeah. Oh. And but yeah, April, May, because uh, spring is beautiful with all the, the cherry trees, all the blossomings, um, all the flowers all around on the streets. Then uh, June, July, August can be crowded and super hot. Mm -hmm. But September, October again could be super special because of the wine festivals. Okay. And December, the Christmas market. But if you happen to come in the summer, it is still very nice because of the music festivals and beach festivals that we have all around in the countryside, countryside actually. Okay. Could you talk about some of the major festivals that occur throughout the year? Uh, the biggest one that is pretty well known all around in the world, maybe you heard about it, it's called Siget Festival, the island okay. festival. We have kind of two main islands within Budapest. One is more on the north and that festival is held for one week, seven or eight days. You can stay on the island if you're on tent, in, in your own tent or you just visit the island during the day and you go back to your hotel after the last concert. Uh, different type of music, but like non-stop. <laughs> mm -hmm. It started to, when they started, it was like more like a hippie kind of festival, but now it's like for every age. So even you can go with your baby, you can uh, tell your grandparents to see that concert because it's pretty cool. So it's super, super cool. Actually, you can buy a ticket for one day or for the whole week as well. But it's better to book in advance if you really want to go. Because the good prices, the early bird prices are gone maybe in May when they finalize the participants, the bands. Mm -hmm. And so I know Christmas markets are a very big thing in Europe. Uh, what you, I guess you said in Budapest, it's the same there. Do you have, or yeah, I guess, would you have any like local tips for those? Tips? Uh, usually these markets open on the last week of November and they last until the last week of December. I believe the earlier you come, the better. So people are more relaxed. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, the main bus, uh, market at the St. Stephen's Basilica. It's a tiny little square, not even that tiny, but it's a lovely square with lots of um, vendors selling home uh, homemade or handcrafted uh, products like soaps, chocolates, bonbons, sausages and salamis, even outfit. So, so yeah, you can get everything that you need. They sell food as well, but I would avoid the food vendors, <laughs> I say. But if you leave that square and you go to the surrounding area for food, you pay much less and you get better quality. Okay. And so, so yeah, that's my advice. <laughs> and how cold does it get in Budapest over the winter? Uh, lately, it was not super cold. The summers are worse. It's getting, yeah, hotter and hotter, right? Mm -hmm. But last few years, temperature was around 
Let me see. It's like, I think it's 32 in Fahrenheit. Okay, like right at bit, freezing. Yeah, it's like a bit below, like a bit colder. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we didn't really have snow in the last okay. uh, few years. Actually, it was snowing <laughs> like two or three times in November, December only. Okay. In January, February again, it was twice maybe. So it's not like... You know, 20 years ago, we knew that Christmas is going to be white. Yeah. It's not true anymore. It's You know that the sun is going to be shining and it's just warm. And me, I can't enjoy summer if it's like beach time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how hot does it get in the summer now? Last year, it was super hot, but in a row, like yeah. nonstop. Uh, around 100 Fahrenheit for, okay. for many weeks. So mm -hmm. it can be very dry. Wow. I mean, you can do, you can still do stuff and you can uh, see the city, you can do sightseeing, you can enjoy the thermal bus, but yeah, you just need some shade and more water with you. That's it. Mm -hmm. So would you say that in general, uh, Budapest is sunny and uh, not too cloudy, rainy? Not really, no. Though May and November meant to be the rainiest months, but in the last five, ten years, no. because of the uh, climate changes, you can't tell. But not yeah. really. Probably no. this week was, I mean, the last few days were more gray, but that's the normal weather in uh, March at home mm. in the past. Mm -hmm. But you cannot tell. February was super hot it wasn't a cold at all it was like the weather here i mean in your area in the states in texas area but mm -hmm. um, it was pretty mild or yeah. unfortunately so it's not always good that it is warm but the nature needs some you know rain and it was no any yeah okay makes sense um so could we talk a bit about the Hungarian language? It I know just looking at it, it looks completely uh, different than any other like romance style language. Uh, are there any basic like words and phrases that you like to teach uh, tourists? Uh, the first thing that they usually want to know is like, how do you say cheers? Mm. You say Egeshegedra. It's super confusing. I know. <laughs> But it was a friend of mine who told me that because the guy is from the United States living in Hungary, he said that you should tell your guests to say, I guess she, I guess that she can drive, but super fast. <laughs> okay. But if it's still too difficult, you can just use the shorter form, which is eggy. Eggy. Okay. Instead of eggy shigedre, you can say just eggy. If mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, not a formal conversation, but informal, you can just say, Aggie, with okay. your new friends, with your family. So, yeah. And the Hungarian language itself, does it uh, get influences from other parts of, or other languages in Europe, or it's kind of its own thing? Uh, it's part of the Finnish okay. languages, but, I mean, we are on, when you check the language tree, we are on the same um, on the same field, but we don't have any common words, not really. So yeah, our language is super difficult. As I've been told, it's among the five or six most difficult languages in the world. Yes, I can confirm. <laughs> <laughs> so as as a kid, I was suffering a lot. Me actually, it was easier for me because I loved reading. So it, it's always help if you read a lot of books and novels. But all the grammatical rules and the fact that in Hungary we use 42 letters, in English you use 26, but we mm -hmm. use 42 vowels with different type of accents. We combine two letters, then there is a new letter. So it's, well. it's <laughs> annoying. <laughs> can be annoying. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a kid, you just absorb all the rules and knowledge, yeah. like easier. Mm -hmm. But as a grown-up person, it's like, you know, it can crack your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So do would you say most people or a lot of people in Budapest speak English or another language or how um, if a tourist came to Budapest and only spoke English, how in trouble would they be? The younger generation, I mean, yeah, the younger people like aged like up to 50, mm -hmm. I'm sure that everybody would would be able to, to speak to you or help with the navigation. But um, actually, when you are, or when I was a seven-year-old girl, me, actually, my parents had to make a decision. It's like I studied English or German language because mm. of Germany and Austria were super close. So many people picked German, actually. But I believe that more people used English so you might fair you might you may find some people who would try to talk you in german mm. the the much older generation had to learn russian because of the soviet uh, influence we we had the russians in hungary until 1989 and it was compulsory even for me it was compulsory though the soviets left already but for some other years, it was still compulsory in school. So I've been uh, hmm. studying Russian for 12 years, though I'm not using it. So my main is English. And then in a way, I started to learn some French and Spanish. But it's not like, you know, uh, uh, you know, a very strong skill, unfortunately, but working on it. So English, yeah, I think it would work. You wouldn't feel this, he lost. Okay, cool. So could you talk more about the the, the Hungarian culture? Uh, just, I mean, it, with all these different influences, it sounds like, um, how would you say the, the people of Hungary are? In um, terms of, we'll say friendliness to like tourists or things like that. No, people realize like 10 years ago that maybe even more, but since I'm working in tourism, you know, I, I can really tell that people became so much friendlier and more open, especially the young generation. When students go go to go abroad and spend a year as an expert student somewhere else, so even we we host so much experts in Hungary who come to study or to work. For a couple of years, we have international marriages. So these little facts do help. Okay. So yeah, the atmosphere is welcoming for sure. Cool. Um, for the uh, culture of Hungary, um, is there anything that you tell your people that might be different than what they're used to? What what times do you mean? I'm sorry. <laughs> so we'll say like if uh, somebody was at a restaurant or something like that, is there anything with the food culture that would be different than America? Ah. Uh, food culture, of course, it's very different. I would say that, um, yeah, Hungarian food itself, if I just think of the main and the most commonly known traditional dishes, uh, those dishes are super heavy. When you order food, you get a nice dish with lots of side dish, big meat, some sauce, maybe a little... Um, like decoration, it's like a slice of tomato, but it's not like, you know, super colorful. It, it doesn't contain like vegetables. It's not like when you go to Greece or Turkey, it's like half of the plate is like full of vegetables. Here you have to ask for salad, but mostly uh, pickles on the side separately. It's on the menu, but on a different page. So Hungarian people, as I recognize, especially again, the older generation, they tend to eat lots of carbs and meat. If you feed your husband or boyfriend with, with a vegetarian dish, okay, but what's for food? They must <laughs> have uh, meat on the plate and it, mm -hmm. it must be a big portion. It's important what you see if it's small, but Actually, it's his feeling. No, it doesn't matter. It must be big. <laughs> and on the table, in every restaurant, actually, you will find fresh bread always in a basket because Hungarian people eat bread with everything. Me, I don't because then I would be <laughs> pretty chubby. So it's always bread. Almost all the dishes contain red paprika. 
It's mm. the most uh, popular spice. I mean, I'm talking about the most well-known uh, food foods. Mm-hmm. Red paprika, sour cream, and then bread. Nice. Yeah, these three drinks are very, <laughs> very common here in okay. Hungary. And are there any safety concerns that anybody should be aware of when traveling, or would you say it's a pretty safe country? Mm-hmm. It is safe. So even when I finish late in the evening, like 11, 12, sometimes it is 1 a.m. because I just, you know, uh, walk my group to a club. Then I know they are safe and I say bye. And I I am happy to walk home. I'm not scared because it's a safe city. It's We don't really have crime, maybe twice per year, but it's not, not bad at all mm-hmm. so far. But... Uh, the thing that you should keep in mind that I guess it's everywhere in the world that be careful with the taxi cab drivers. Mm. So when you see a cab, no, all the cabs are yellow, but on the side, it may say freelancer cab. Then okay. you should just avoid it really because <laughs> once they smile that you're a tourist or you're American, okay, he's going to pay me three times more. He doesn't know. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So yeah, not not to use freelancer cabs, but we don't have Uber. Probably we're gonna have Uber again. That's what I read so far. Mm. But there is another application called Bolt B O L T. Okay. You download and once you put your destination, it will show you the price. Mm-hmm. So you can they cannot play with it. They cannot go like a much you know longer way. To, yeah. to charge you more, but it will say the money that they're going to charge for you for the service. Okay. And I've also heard the public transportation system is really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get anywhere like super fast and super easy. You just buy one ticket, like single ticket. You can buy a ticket that valid for 90 minutes, nine zero, or you can get like a three-day pass or week pass or... A monthly pass even. It's super cheap, actually. The monthly ticket would cost you... That is the the most reasonable option if you stay for long, for more than a week. It's like uh, $30, kind of. Wow. Yeah, one single ticket costs 1.3, maybe. Okay. $1.3. So if you eat out, if you visit a restaurant... You pay for the the food, you get the invoice, like 95% of the time, they put the service fee automatically on the mm. bill. Nowadays, it's 12, 15. If it's a Michelin star restaurant, it's like 18%. And they mm-hmm. list it as a service fee. But mm-hmm. if it's not service fee, it might be another weird word in Hungarian. It's You don't know, right? It's yeah. so you should always ask the waiter if the service is included, okay. but some of the places would expect some tip as well. So On top of the I, service yeah. fee? I don't really like the idea. So it's your decision because you already paid the service and why to pay another 10 or 20%, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, you just do as you want. Okay, so there's not like a, a standard... Uh that most people would go by? Uh, you know what? <laughs> As they put it automatically on the bill, mm-hmm. you decide if you want to leave more. I would just, you know, leave the coins or I wouldn't ask the change back. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if it's like, if it was really excellent, you just give them some more in cash. Yeah. So for most places, will you need cash or you can use card or... No, you use card, but okay. to tip people in restaurants and bars, they, they are happy, more happy for cash. Because sure. if it's, you know, added to the card or the uh, the bank uh, account, then they have mm-hmm. to pay taxes after. So at the end, it's like you gave, but you didn't. Kind yeah. Of. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, going back to the public transportation, I heard that um, Budapest actually had the first underground uh, public transportation in Europe. Do you know if that's true? Uh, 
in a way, but actually it's not the oldest. The oldest is in the UK, in London. But if we just say the continent, then mm -hmm. it's true. So that line uh, is from 1896, like many other things in Hungary. I mean, in Budapest, the mayor sites are from that area, era. Mm -hmm. It was the actually the 1000th anniversary of the country because the very first Hungarian people settled down in 896. So 1000 years later, they were like, oh my God, it's a special year. Let's celebrate this nice anniversary by building this and that, including the Metro, Metro line. And it's still operating. <laughs> Wow. So what would you say is the best area to stay in when somebody's visiting or an area for them to avoid? Um, if to avoid, I would say like an area just because it's like super touristy or super busy and not because it's not safe or dirty. We have beautiful and clean streets. All the areas are nice, really. But if you happen to stay in the castle area, or next to the basilica, it can be busy, like noisy and just tons of people. Me personally, I love the area of the opera house. You would see mm -hmm. more locals, restaurants with lower prices. Now it's a nice road called Andrashi Avenue, which is a bit like Champs Elysees in Paris. They have some nice places, even a cafe, or there is now a W, a hotel. Mm. which has a nice terrace area. You sit and you admire the building of the Opera House. So to me, it's more more lovely. That's it. Like you see more local people. Mm -hmm. And would you recommend would... to stay in hotels, Airbnbs, or just whatever floats your boat? Depends what you want. Me, most of the time, I see American people staying in hotels. And they like those hotels. We have very nice hotels, four and five star hotels as well. We have tons of boutique hotels as well. Mm -hmm. But even Airbnbs, you can find very good deals. Me, when I travel, I try to stay in Airbnbs actually. Mm -hmm. Because it's more in an area where you see more locals, you stay at somebody's place, you get the vibe of the culture in a way. Yeah. It's my own <laughs> preference. Sure. Yeah. So whatever uh, you prefer, just. Uh... Yeah. Plus, I love to prepare some food on my own, you know. Yeah. Not always going to a restaurant. Um, it's just more cozy. Yeah. So talking more about the food, what would you say are some of the must try dishes when you're in Budapest? Of course, everybody's talking about gulai soup. Mm -hmm. It's a heavy soup. Actually, it it's either goulash soup or a beef stew that can again can be called goulash. But in terms of goulash, it's usually beef and vegetables with red paprika powder. And you have you can have beans in it. You have some bread on the side and you have it with a spoon. It's it's a soup. Or if it's beef stew goulash, it's it's thicker. It's like a sauce. Some of the places, or even me at home, would add some red wine in it, but it's not, you know, alcoholic at all, but mm -hmm. it just helps the flavor. And you have some side dish on the side, like uh, um, boiled potatoes or fresh noodles. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that everybody's talking about. But when I uh, do a food tour, of course, we can stop somewhere so as to try that soup, but I try to focus on those foods that we have at home, really, like more often than gulai soup. But still, <laughs> those dishes, like most of the time, contain red paprika powder, which doesn't have to be like spicy. It can be sweet, hot, and smoked as well. Mm -hmm. Sweet and hot, sweet and smoked, smoked and uh, sweet and smoked and hot as well. <laughs> so, so yeah. There is a dish that I really like. It's like um, a crepe, like pancake, mm. but very thin, like the French style. Mm -hmm. And you fill it with minced beef and a sauce and some sour cream. That's what I'm preparing at the moment, actually. That's uh -huh. why I'm talking about this dish. So it's a crepe with savory filling, chicken or beef inside. 
or we have the potato casserole. It's like layered potatoes, layered boiled potatoes. You put boiled eggs on top and then sausages and some sour cream. You repeat it twice or three times and you cover it with another sour cream layer with some eggs. And then you put cheese on top. Mm. You just put it in the oven and in one hour later, it's, 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 a, it's a great dish. But we have tons of thick vegetable soups, a lot of food, lots of bread products, <laughs> lots of sweet things, good dessert. So if you are in Budapest, you must see the the cake shops. It's like you enter mm. to, you want to spend two hours there. You sit, you are served, you ask for a coffee and the cake. It's it's a great combination. Okay, we have and a lot. What uh, what were the names, sorry, of the crepe dish and the uh, sour cream, the second one? Uh, the crepe dish is called Hortobagi Palacinta. Okay. Hortobagi Palacinta. The other, the layered potato dish is called as uh, Rakot Krumpli. Okay. And... These are more like, you, you don't necessarily find these dishes in restaurants, but mm -hmm. we eat it a lot. Hungarian okay. people prepare it a lot. Mm -hmm. So for restaurants, are there any that you would specifically recommend people to uh, visit? Uh, we have a lot that I really like. There is one uh, called uh, Ghetto Goulash. Okay. It is actually a place that offers all the traditional meals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from Hungary. There is another one called Menza. They have, uh, again, Hungarian food plus other type of food for ad for those people who rather stay in their comfort zones and they can have salmon and risotto mm. as well. Let me see. There is one. It's on the other side of Buda called Derine Bistro. It's a bistro stride restaurant, but they have, uh, again, very nice food. They Sometimes they have a nice dessert on the menu called Sweet cottage cheese balls. So it's made of cottage cheese and semolina and some sugar. And then you boil this kind of ball and then you put this whole ball in sweet breadcrumbs. And then you put sour cream and icing <laughs> sugar and cinnamon and some lemon <laughs> zest in wow. it. So it's super, super great. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, what would you say are the common meal times in Hungary? <sighs> It varies. If you do the special nine, eight to five typical job, then you mm -hmm. just don't eat breakfast or you have something on the go and you have something later with a cup of tea, uh, coffee in your office. Lunchtime, like between those people who work in offices, they are like, you see tons of people on the streets after 11.30, maybe yeah. until 1.30, mm -hmm. because like most of the restaurants offer a special uh, lunch menu in Budapest. It's like, mm. I don't even know the prices now, but let's say 10 for $10, you get a main mm -hmm. and a starter, like a soup and the main dish. Some of the places would give you a glass of drink mm -hmm. and then you pay this amount of money, but they have the set menu. You cannot change the soup to another one, but yeah. you see it what's available today, today mm -hmm. that day. But it's a good deal, so it's like for less money, you can try all the nice restaurants for mm -hmm. less money if yeah. you go on a weekday. And sure. it's not only for locals, it's for, for tourists as well. Nobody will ask you. Mm -hmm. But it's a good way to explore all the great restaurants around lunchtime. At dinner time, I would say that people normally book a table for seven, seven, okay. seven. Okay. Yeah. So not too uh, dissimilar to, I would say, most times in America. Mm -mm. No, we don't have siesta. So the places <laughs> won't be closed around lunchtime, like in the Mediterranean countries, like in Spain. Mm -hmm. So everything is open throughout the whole day. Easy enough. Yeah. So what uh, what are some places that you would say are the must-see visits when you're in Budapest? I'd say it's it's my personal favorite to see the basilica, the St. Stephen's Basilica. Mm -hmm. And there's possible to go on the top level of the basilica. It 
actually operates as a lookout tower. You you have to pay for the admission, but the view is pretty amazing, right? Because you see the city from a 30, 360 degree. Mm. So it's very nice. Uh, if you wanted to see the building of the parliament, I mean, inside, you must, you should purchase your ticket much in advance mm. to make sure that you, you can see <laughs> the building. There is a church uh, in the castle zone called as the Matthias Church. It's again a super old church built in the Renaissance style. It's it's pretty amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do like rooftop bars again to to visit one of the rooftop bars just just around the sunset hours. You have your drink or tea. You don't have to be an ugly person so as to <laughs> enjoy this view. But uh, yeah. It's pretty nice to enjoy the city view, the sunset, and just the vibe, especially if it's summer. It's it's like not to miss. <laughs> mm -hmm. And how many and, days would you recommend somebody to spend in Budapest? I mean, to really feel it, I would say four days, at least. Mm -hmm. Two days is, is, is not enough. No, four nights, five days, maybe, minimum. Okay, so you'd say you, you you should spend at least a day or two in each of the different regions, the Buddha, Old Buddha. Yeah, Pesh. yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay. And this, and then just one day you're just chilling, you visit one of the thermal baths. Mm. One day you can plan like a half-day trip to a little city called Santandra. It's like a 30 minutes drive from away from Budapest, but it's super picturesque and very sweet. It's on the side of the river, lots of little shops and restaurants, pretty narrow streets. It's cute. Mm -hmm. Could you talk more about the thermal baths? I, I know that's a kind of a, a big thing in Budapest. Yes. Underneath the ground, uh, you would find thermal water, like super hot water with mineral content, healing, with healing power. Mm -hmm. So when you go to these places, when you go to these pools, the temperature of this water, it's a bit cooled down. So it's very enjoyable. The temperature of the water is around or a bit more than 100 Fahrenheit. Okay. So it's great to spend like three, four hours there. Maybe you book a book, uh, massage, uh, massage appointment as well. Afterwards, I'm sure you're going to be like, oh, I just want to sleep. <laughs> At first, mm -hmm. you want to eat, and then you are wrecked for the rest of the day. But next day, you're like, what happened? I feel so much more energy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So are there any specific uh, thermal baths that you would recommend? Um, that is a big one. That Actually, it's very nice, and I love it, especially if I go when they open 7 in the morning because there is no mm. tourists, less locals. Some local guys would play chess in the pool. <laughs> it is so mm -hmm. funny or sweet. But after 11, when the tourists uh, uh, wake up, it's like, unless you want to see tons of people, it's cool. So early morning, that big pool called Sechenyi. Mm -hmm. But there is a personal favorite of mine. It's called Valley Bay. It's a smaller turkey spa. It's indoor, but they have one larger pool and three smaller pools on the sides. And they also have saunas and steams, a relaxation room. So they open either in the morning. I mean, you can go in the morning. They close for midday because they have treatments for the hospital next door. Mm. So they keep it for the guests. And after 3 p.m. again, you can go. So I really love this one because it's quieter, it's darker, it's peaceful, and not touristy. It is called Valley Bay. It's okay. a Turkish one. Cool. Um, and is there anything else that you would recommend people to do during their trip? Uh, we have nice vines in Hungary. Plus to do like... Um, sunset uh, boating tour mm. it, it's also very nice to do it in an hour it's you are like on a sh on a boat for one hour yeah. they show you the most impressive sights you may get a drink or you just buy some for yourself but yeah it's it's sweet it's a nice thing to do 
And this is uh, along the Danube? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Between the downtown area. Mm -hmm. And am I pronouncing that right? I feel like Danube, Danube. I've heard both ways. Danube in English, but at home, I mean, in Hungary, we say Duna. Ah, okay. Duna. Interesting. I wonder why the, the difference there. Mm -hmm. It's okay. <laughs> People <laughs> would understand what you mean. Fair enough. Um, cool. So for anybody who wants to pick up any souvenirs on their trip, uh, is there any specific area or place that you would recommend uh, for them? Oh, actually, all around in the city, we have small vintage stores, small gift stores. I'm, and I am not talking about the typical stores when you get the Budapest magnets, but um, we have some smaller streets in, in uh, District 7. It's the ruin bar area where you have lots of murals. It's, by the way, called as the Jewish um, quarter in Budapest. So in that area, you would find small shops with more exquisite and unique gift ideas. Perfect. And just to start wrapping things up, is there anything else that you think people should know before coming to Budapest for the first time? <sighs> Let me see. Like any mistakes that you uh, see a, a lot of people make uh, when coming over? If not mistakes, but some people know, think that we use euro. In a way, it's true because in most of the places you can pay in euros, but mm. it can be tricky because of the exchange rate they apply. So sometimes mm -hmm. you pay 20, 30 percent more because you paid in yeah. euro in cash. So if you didn't have the Hungarian cash, just use your card and pick the Hungarian currency mm -hmm. on the terminal. That's it. <laughs> cool. Any anything else? Well, we covered sure. pretty much everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't talk about the Grand Market Hall. It's a place that sells lots of uh, fresh products, including meat and cheese and uh, fruits and vegetables. And the on the top level, they have some souvenir shops. It's a bit pricey. But mm. on the other side, they sell food. They have little buffets where you can try the most uh, typical foods and bites. Very cool. You can have nice little snacks <laughs> in that market. And on the top level of the market, there is a place that says the most uh, uh, popular um, Hungarian street food. It's called as langos. It looks like if it was a pizza. It's a mm -hmm. flat but deep fried dough. And we usually, Hungarians, we ask for this langos that contains some, that has some... Uh, sour cream, grated cheese, and garlic mm. cream on it. But mm. tourists just call it as the Hungarian pizza because if you go <laughs> to that place or to some other language places, it's like a, a menu with 50 different kind of language dishes. But we never ask for spaghetti, uh, no, ragu bolognese on top, nor ham and cheese, it's touristy, <laughs> nor mm. banana and Nutella on top. It mm. was just an idea to attract more tourists, but <laughs> Hungarians would go for the classic one. Good to know. Yeah. Per so we don't have Hungarian pizza, but yeah, looks like <laughs> <laughs> something similar. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, thank you so much. This has been really awesome. If somebody is coming to Budapest and is looking to find a tour guide or just looking to learn more about the city, how can they connect with you? Um, thank you for asking. I'm on TripAdvisor. People phone me under the name of like Kata Tour Guide in Budapest. I'm on Facebook again. It's Kata Tour Guide in Budapest, and I'm working on my website. But I have Instagram as well. It is Kata Budapest Tour Guide. So these are the main streams where I. I can be found. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And I will leave links to uh, everything you've recommended as well thank as you. uh, your website and that um, on mine. Uh, but yeah, once again, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a lovely time. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Kata. 
Once again, for all of our recommendations and more, be sure to check out my website, www.tllpod.com. And if you'd like to learn how to make goulash, you can find my recipe video on TikTok and Instagram at tll underscore pod. Be sure to come back next week to see what city we dive into next. But until then, happy traveling.